welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Jenny Barber, a poet, editor, and scholar who has a deep and multifaceted relationship with words. Jenny's poetry is spare and moving, rich yet controlled. So much lies beneath the surface of her writing, yet she never forgets the reader who will see or hear her work. Jenny is the editor and founder of Salamander, a literary journal now in its 20th year. Jenny started Salamander with the intention of giving voice to young poets and to those who deserve a wider audience. She views editing as a form of exploring. Jenny's poetry has been influenced by both her editing and her study of the Hebrew Bible, which has broadened her sense of mystery and realities we cannot see. Jenny's new book of poems is called Given Away. Her first collection, Rigging the Wind, received the 2002 Corey Press First Book Award. Her poems have appeared in Orion, Bellevue Literary Review, Agni, Harvard Review, the Gettysburg Review, and the New Yorker, among others. She has received a Pushcart Prize, the Anna Davidson Rosenberg Award, and a St. Patalov Grant. In addition to editing Salamander, Jenny also teaches English literature and creative writing at Suffolk University. Jenny, welcome to the set. Thank you. It took us a while to get here because of the rough winter, but I know that your words are going to inspire people. Thank you. So please open with a poem. Okay. Um, I thought I'd read a poem from my first book, Rigging the Wind. Um, and the book has a lot of poems uh, that are set in Spain, where I lived for a time. And the poem I'll read uh, is about uh, the village that I lived in. And in the village, there were mostly older people there, and many of them had in living memory the, um, the Spanish Civil War, mm. um, which um, they often were reluctant to talk about. This is called Night. No one here dreams louder than the wind, knocking at the doors where Franco's men conscripted farmer's sons 50 years ago. It blows over strips of farms no wider than a pony run, in rivers made of diphthongs like the Eo, through the greedy heads of eucalyptus trees, the bearded, maimed pines, and villages whose steeples are crowned with absurdly large stork nests set awry. After a card game in the bar, the men scrape back their chairs. They leave in twos and threes. Children and grandchildren have moved to cities farther south. The men are all that's left. A knock at the door and the wind's long memory of a bloody mountain pass, thigh deep in mud. Mm. That poem is so vivid and so surprising at various points because you choose your words so carefully. And in that book, you also choose to have the wind as a recurring sound or theme. Yes. Why did you make that choice? Uh, well, the part of Spain uh, where I was living with my husband is Galicia. Um, it's the northwest corner of the country, and it's very windy. Um, the village we were in um, is very close to the ocean. And um, so I guess that just became a theme in many of the poems. When you have the wind blowing uh, hard for several days in a row, it makes you think about all kinds of different things. Uh, it's kind of a haunting sound that the wind makes um, uh, during the storms that they had. Mm. 
Well, I like the fact that with the wind, like so many elements in your writing or your editing, there is sort of the, the fact, the basic fact of how wind moves, but then there's also the element of mystery. Yes. And that happens in so much of what you do. Tell us a little bit about how a poem starts for you. Well, for me, a poem often starts with something that I've seen. Um, that I want to describe. So in that sense, a poem could often begin uh, with an image. And I guess the other way that a poem might start for me is just uh, a particular rhythm or uh, sounds of words um, strung together. Mm -hmm. And so once the poem starts, does it come to you in, say, a single line, or is it something more? Um, well, I think the first line um, usually for me uh, sets out a kind of direction. I don't really know what that direction will be, but if I can um, nail down a beginning to a poem, mm -hmm. then I often trust that the poem will develop. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the, f the first line for me is very important, the opening of a poem. Mm -hmm. And in some of our previous conversations, we've talked about the fact that when you're writing, there is a point where you sort of feel like you're in control of the poem or you're driving the poem. And then you reach a moment where things shift and you lose control of the wheel, so to speak. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think that um, when you're writing a poem, there are times where you think you know where you're headed but as the poem develops, uh, you might get lost during the writing of it. And it's almost as if you need to get lost in order to be able to get to the true poem that wants to be written. Mm -hmm. So if you have too much of an idea of where you're going in a poem, uh, sometimes that can work to the detriment of the discoveries that you might make otherwise mm -hmm. uh, that uh, will surprise you. Mm. Your poems are so well honed, and every word counts and is chosen with such care. Does it take a lot of revision to achieve a poem like that? Uh, for me, it does. I'm somebody who revises quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the revision process will um, happen in a concentrated span of time mm -hmm. over a week or a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it will take up to a month or even several months. Sometimes I need to step away from a poem to mm -hmm. be able to really uh, see the poem. Mm -hmm. When you and I were emailing back and forth, I yes. asked you a similar question. And part of your answer was so thought-provoking that I want to share it now. You were talking about the fact that you don't revise according to a plan. So how do you settle on one phrase instead of another, one kind of moment versus another? And then you said this, or for that matter, how does a painter decide where and how to apply the next brushstroke to a painting? I guess it's partially a process of trying out different things until you get something that feels right, that feels complete. And once that happens, you're finally able to step back and let go of the poem. For me, the process is not necessarily a purely pleasurable sensation, but one that's very absorbing. Mm. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think there's... Um no feeling like it when you're really immersed in a poem. Mm -hmm. But what I meant by saying it's not pleasurable is sometimes because you do feel really lost, mm -hmm. um, you have the feelings that, um, that go with that, mm -hmm. um, almost feeling a little bit disoriented. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to write uh, early in the morning. Um, I wake up at 5 and write for a couple of hours, and I mm -hmm. often find at 7 when I need to uh, get my daughter um, up to go to school, that it's very hard to pull away from the desk and mm -hmm. from the poem mm -hmm. uh, because I am so immersed in it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. 
Now, when you're editing, that's a different kind of immersion. Yes. It's a different kind of exploration. Can you tell us a little about that process? Yeah, um, well, instead of having to um, create something, you're looking uh, at something that's already been created. And uh, it's kind of a wonderful thing because you can just uh, let yourself into a poem that somebody else has made mm -hmm. and appreciate it and think about it and go uh, to the place that that poem brings you. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes when I need a break from writing a poem, it's wonderful to be able to shift into that mode of reading poems by other people. And then as an editor, um, it's a great thing to be able to fall in love with a poem by somebody else and have the power to um, let that poem appear in print and know that it will have other readers. Mm -hmm. So it's a, one of the great pleasures of being an editor. Mm -hmm. When you and I spoke earlier, you talked about daydreaming and concentration both in, during the writing process and reading other people's work. Tell us what you meant by daydreaming when you're reading someone's poetry. Well, um, when you're reading uh, someone's poem and the poem reaches you, one of the things that I believe a poem can do is put the reader uh, in a different kind of touch with their own experience. So I was reading a poem about childhood the other day, and um, that poem put me back in touch with um, some parts of my own childhood that I hadn't thought about in years, particular memories. So and that, that's a goal I have for my own poetry, too, is that somebody reading it um, will think of something from their own life that they can relate to from the poem. So rather than always thinking of the poem as something that um, focuses the listener entirely on the world of that poem, I like to think of um, a poem as something that um, might drop out of the reader's hand mm. for a while um, while they think about their own life, and then they'll pick it up again and go somewhere else in the poem. Mm. That's a wonderful way of describing it, and a very generous way of thinking about the reader's process or the reader's participation in what becomes sort of a, a communication back and forth instead of just a one-way communication. Yes, I, I don't think a, a poem is, reading a poem is about just receiving it. I think it is mm. about interacting mm -hmm. with it. Mm. And that's lovely because I think many people feel like, oh, well, that poem is someone else's work. I don't have a right to interact with it. But yet you're saying, yes, there is room. Yes, I think that's a very important mm -hmm. aspect of poetry. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're writing, I know that at some point during the process, you do consider the reader who will eventually see or hear your work. Mm -hmm. At what point do you start thinking about who might be receiving the words uh, well, usually for me that's later on in the process. Uh, my first uh, thing is to um, figure some things out with the words. Um, and then later on I might think about the reader. And my hope always is to develop an intimacy with the reader where um, it is just the two of us mm -hmm. um, in some kind of uh, communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I asked you beforehand was about the process of writing and how do you know when to push the poem a little more? How do you know when to open it up and how do you know when to keep it tightly reined? And you said something that I really loved, so I want to share that with everybody. You said, I want to let the reader enter the poem as much as possible by using suggestion more than statement. And also, I want to encourage the reader to make associative leaps in a poem. I realize that this aesthetic runs the risk of leaving 
some readers puzzled or only appealing to a smaller pool of readers, those who enjoy filling in the spaces or silences with their own thoughts, but this aesthetic seems to be the one I opt for. I aim to hone and hopefully clarify by reducing things to their essence. And this is the part I love the most. I don't aspire to be well-mannered. In fact, if anything, I need to risk bad manners more often, which may, in turn, lead to more wildness. I would like that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there are a couple of um, different things to say about that. Um, my usual veering away from direct statements is to make that space for the reader. And the idea of suggestion, um, again, is that so the reader will feel more actively involved in the poem. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of wildness and manners, <laughs> that might be harder to describe. Um, but you do, in a poem, want to venture into an area that maybe hasn't been covered before in a particular way, mm -hmm. mm. Um, cross a different kind of line or border. Mm -hmm. Now, another area of your life where there is the balance between control and mystery is in your study of the Hebrew Bible and yes. how that has influenced your own writing. Tell us a little bit about what that study has been like. Well, um, I think one of the biggest mysteries might be the fact that we still read the Bible thousands of years after it was written. Hmm. Um, and. The question about that is, why do these words that were written so long ago in a very different world, an ancient world, still have resonance for us? Mm -hmm. And I have been um, taking a class in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's a class that meets once a week, and it's been going on for nine years now. And it really has opened up a new world for me, a, mm. a world of um, language and the different genres that you find in the Bible, uh, the, the kind of range of writings that are there. Mm -hmm. In the class, we've really been looking um, at the whole thing. And I think it's more common in our day-to-day -day lives that we just remember um, particular parts or particular stories. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the, the Bible as an entire entity. How does that change things for you? What has been the surprise there? Well, again, I think it's uh, the range of works and the variety. And um, many of those works are trying to express something that's very hard to express, that there is this other dimension in life or was to those writers of the Bible um, that was mysterious. Uh, they um, saw it as God and described it as God. Um, we might or might not describe it that way today. Mm -hmm. But they were trying to capture um, the essence of what that was and the sense that they felt another presence um, that was there uh, in their human lives and their, uh, their difficulties. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put. But again, I'm thinking of something that you said in an email that I think is worth sharing. You were talking about reading the scriptures, and you said, above all for me, the change in perception vis-a-vis -vis the use of words had to do with the idea that poetry could be a way to summon something beyond and outside and wholly other than the self to be in its vicinity, however fleetingly. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think um, when you write poems, you spend a lot of time in a kind of state of introspection. Mm -hmm. And you do look at the self a lot. Um, but there comes a time when you long for something um, beyond the confinement of the self. Mm -hmm. 
mm. and mm -hmm. really long to understand a different kind of dimension to life. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, reading uh, the Hebrew Bible kind of later on in my life has really opened up that dimension. I'm not sure um, earlier on if I would have been able to um, engage in reading the Bible in that same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You have a poem that you want to share with us about or that sort of jumps off from a certain passage in the Bible. Could you share it? Oh, sure. Um, this is a poem that um, has as its starting point um, some reading of the Song of Songs in the Bible. And um, the Song of Songs is often treated as if it were an allegory about um, God and God's people or sometimes um, an allegory of the church and, the, and mm -hmm. the people. But when we were studying it in this class that I take, um, what we really decided about it was that it really is about the people described in the poem. It's not an allegory. Mm. And it's a very beautiful, sensuous poem about two lovers. So in this poem, I kind of um, went in that direction um, when considering the Song of Songs. So here's the poem. The lovers, in their urgency, met on the hill. It was nighttime. It was dawn. Sun shone on the garden wall, on the startled new branches of the apple trees. It was noon. It was afternoon for the gossips at the gate, the almond tree, the fig, the spring light on the grass the betraying bird calls. No one knew what to say to the lovers in their need. Mm. I love the specificity in that poem. It wasn't just noon, it was afternoon mm. for the gossips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in the Song of Songs, um, time does pass um, during it. So you have the lovers at different times of day and night and different places, and they're trying to meet up and they're making declarations about each other. Mm -hmm. How does viewing the Song of Songs as just a story about two lovers, how does that open up the book for you? Um, well, it's interesting that the Song of Songs ended up being included in the Bible because I think you could say it probably is the most um, secular dimension of the Bible. And we did talk about that uh, in our class, why it might have ended up there. And we talked about the fact that maybe it ended up there just because the language was so beautiful that the people compiling the Bible um, before it became a fixed entity um, couldn't bear not to include it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I love that idea. Believe it or not, we are almost out of time. So you have another poem that you are going to share with us. Yes. Um, this poem um, has to do with um, reading the Psalms. And I did spend one summer going through the 150 Psalms and reading them and rereading them and thinking about the fact that um, unlike the prophets where you have um, long sections where uh, God is, um, God's speech is kind of quoted by the prophet because the prophet is communicating that um, to people. Uh, in the Psalms, you don't really have the voice of God. The Psalms are all um, addressed to God but God doesn't answer. Mm. Uh, so this poem is called, God Doesn't Speak in the Psalms. And that's what I like. A flock of psalms, a deck, a pack, shuffling praise and fear and need. 
Last night in my dream, a donkey's tongue ripped out by the children of the town. The donkey stood in a small field. I didn't know if he could eat. I left an apple by his hoof. No inkling of an afterlife, no scale pans for weighing souls to see which ones are light and heavy, like metals, like elemental salts. Across the street, a storm door slams. Finches in the juniper fly up. I'm leafing through the Psalms. A man laments the illness wasting him and compares himself to a lone bird on a roof with no prayer, eating ashes of bread. How then does he turn in praise of the sky like a tent over the earth and ancient cities, stones, and dust? August, afternoon, somebody gathers figs. Somebody walks with a seed bag slung over his shoulder, weeping as he sows, an ear, a voice, coming apart between my hands. God doesn't speak in the Psalms. God's spoken to. Mm. That's a beautiful poem and a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much for your words. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, we're HCAM TV, but movies also? Dive In Drive In is a new program featuring the HCAM staff's favorite B movies. Check our schedule at HCAM.TV for the next showing of some of the more forgotten films. Black and white or color, join Mike Terosian and myself as we introduce and give you some interesting facts about the cast and crews of classic movies. We hope you'll enjoy these treasured films of yesteryear.